Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, Iran will definitely use a nuclear weapon against Israel. This according to a former member of the Iranian Foreign Ministry who told Israel's Channel 2 television that if allowed to continue stalling the international community on its nuclear weapons program, Iran will have the know-how to make a nuclear bomb in less than a year. Mohammad Raza Hidari defected from Iran after witnessing the regime slaughter citizens who oppose the government. He now works from abroad to organize a revolution that he hopes will eventually overthrow the hardline Islamic regime. He warned Israel that Iran will definitely use a nuclear weapon against Israel or any other enemy state. A senior aide to Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has warned the world that his government will not allow the international community to intervene in the Syrian civil war. Speaking to the local semi-official mayor news agency, Dr. Ali Akbar Velayati said that an attack against Syria will be considered as an attack against Iran. In defense of the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, the former Iranian foreign minister then claimed that without Syrian support, Iran's allies, Hezbollah and Hamas, would have now been defeated by Israel. As the strongest ally to Damascus, Tehran has provided the Assad regime with money, weapons, training, and support. Members of Iran's Revolutionary Guards have also been fighting on the ground in Syria to keep Assad in power. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights has released details of what they are calling a new massacre in Aleppo. The pro-resistance group claims that 65 people were found executed with their hands bound behind their backs. The violence in Syria has increased over the last week. The Syrian opposition said it had captured an army communications base near Damascus and also detonated a car bomb at an army installation near the Israeli border. This has prompted Israel to take more serious measures to secure the safety of its citizens in the north. Aaron Viner has that story. The IDF has deployed several Iron Dome missile defense batteries in northern Israel to protect citizens from the fallout in Syria. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has convened several assessment meetings with the cabinet over the violence in Syria, which is constantly creeping closer to Israel and has already spilled over the border on multiple occasions. Of greatest concern to Jerusalem is the possibility that Damascus' chemical weapons stockpile could be passed to Hezbollah in Lebanon. According to Vice Premier Sylvain Shalom, who also serves as Israel's Minister for Regional Development, the Western world is united against the transfer of chemical weapons from Syria to Hezbollah or the hands of any other radical party. NATO has deployed the first of six Patriot missile batteries on the Turkish border with Syria. The United States, the Netherlands and Germany are each sending two of the highly sophisticated missile defense systems to Turkey, as well as 400 soldiers to operate them. Ankara requested assistance after several short-range ballistic missiles were fired from within Syria and landed near the Turkish border. Officials of NATO said that the six batteries will be placed near three southeastern Turkish cities to protect 3.5 million Turks from rocket attacks. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi has declared a 30-day state of emergency in the Suez Canal provinces of Port Said, Ismailia and the Suez itself. The Egyptian army has been deployed and curfews are being imposed in all three cities. Violent waves of anti-government protests have ripped through the Arab Republic, leaving dozens of people dead. The opposition claims that Morsi and his Muslim Brotherhood Party are creating a power monopoly. 
and they maintain that the goals of their pro-democracy revolution that ended the rule of former President Hosni Mubarak have not been realized by Morsi's election. More than 60 people have been killed in the latest round of clashes. The Hamas terror organization in the Gaza Strip celebrated the graduation of more than 3,000 Palestinian youths from a terrorist training course last week. The graduates were the first to complete Hamas's new high school military training program in which the young boys were trained to fight against Israel. Each student was taught to scale buildings, crawl under barbed wire, and each drilled in the use of weapons. They were each assigned a Hamas terrorist to oversee their training. 15-year-old Radwan Wasfi said that his mentor taught him the love of jihad as well as battle tactics. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh called for the establishment of more programs like this one and told the audience that this is the generation that will bring victory to its people and liberate their land. The governor of Bethlehem has issued an order barring all Palestinian institutions in his district from having contact with Israel. Abdul Fattah Hamayel said that that decision came in the wake of repeated Israeli calls to deal directly with the Palestinian municipalities and institutions to hold prospective meetings and conferences. This is not the first time that a Palestinian leader has forbidden cooperation with Israel out of apparent fear that regular contact would normalize relations with the Jewish state and make resistance more difficult. American Christian pastor Saeed Aberdini has been sentenced to eight years in an Iranian prison. Saeed has been held since September of last year on charges of endangering national security, brainwashing the youth, and attempting to convert members of Islam to Christianity. Pastor Saeed was in Iran building an orphanage when he was arrested. He's now serving time in one of Iran's most notorious prisons. He has been brutally beaten and is reportedly in poor condition. The pastor's family has appealed to the U.S. State Department to intervene on his behalf, but so far they have chosen not to become involved. The Israeli Ministry of Public Diplomacy and Diaspora Affairs has released a report detailing an alarming rise in the number of attacks against Jewish targets over the past year. According to Minister Yuli Edelstein, the main conclusion emerging from the 2012 report on anti-Semitism is that there was an escalation in violent incidents against Jews around the world compared with the previous year. The president of the European Jewish Congress, Dr. Moshe Kantor, responded to the document by saying that anti-Semitism in Europe is reaching a tipping point where certain Jewish communities on the continent are endangered and that his organization is gravely concerned that the political rise of neo-Nazi parties in Europe have given racists and anti-Semites a certain level of impunity Cantor added that the rise of anti-Israel delegitimization on the left and among the extreme Muslim communities is creating an explosive cocktail for European Jews. The Knesset's Christian Allies Caucus and the World Jewish Congress hosted the seventh annual Night to Honor Israel's Christian Allies at the King David Hotel last week. The event was attended by Christian leaders from around the world as well as Jewish and Israeli officials. The night is reserved to honor and thank Christians who have been steadfast in their commitment to Israel. The mayor of Jerusalem addressed the distinguished guest and was joined by members of the Israeli government from across the political spectrum. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on our rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Marek Stern, son of the late member of Knesset Yuri Stern and member of the board of the Yuri Stern Foundation. Marek, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh. Marek, your father who passed away six years ago is a legend. He was a member of Knesset, a former refusenik from the Soviet Union, and also the founder of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus. Uh, tell us a little bit about your father. My father was a very passionate Zionist. He, he was a true believer in the Jewish state and the Jewish people. And he dedicated his life for the future of the state of Israel and also for the connection, the special connection between Christians and Jewish uh, all around the world. 
You know, one of the things that you've done in, in his memory is to start the Yuri Stern Foundation. What is the Yuri Stern Foundation? It's a foundation that we started in our family together with close friends. That uh, it, the purpose is to commemorate the memory of my father and try to continue the spirit of his deeds for the Jewish people. And uh, basically what we're concentrating now is that we initiated a center, uh, a complementary medical center for cancer patients. We help cancer patients and their family in Israel and throughout Israel, in, in Jerusalem and Israel, uh, by providing them treatments that uh, help them to be, to, to be stronger and to deal with the disease and its complements in a much easier way. You know, this uh, project with uh, helping cancer patients started as a small family oriented thing, but now it's just uh, incredibly huge. Can you tell us about the scope of the operation? We work in a uh, hospital in Jerusalem, which is called Sharei Tzedek, and we, we are there in full capacity in all departments that will with oncological patients. And also we have an outpatient clinic in Jerusalem. And in every year, we help around 8,000 cancer patients and family members in Jerusalem. Amazing. Uh, you know, some of the things that you do is you work with the cancer patients, but you also do other things with the foundation. You have memorials like the uh, uh, road around the Kinneret. Can you tell us a little bit about more of the foundation's activities? Yes, we're also trying to promote my father's memory throughout Israel. In many cities and locations, we have uh, memorial places and, uh, pla and special places like in the Kinneret, the trail around the Kinneret, four, four kilometer trail that is dedicated to my father. And you can walk there just by the Kinneret near Kapur Nahum, which is a uh, also a special place, a holy place for the Christians, and it's, it shows also his love to the nature and the views of, of Israel, of the Holy Land, uh, much of his spirit. You know, your father was a visionary in reaching out to Christians from the Knesset, the Parliament of Israel, and today the organization works with Christians as well. Why is it so important that Jews and Christians work together? I think that both, you might say, people uh, nations uh, believe in the purpose of Jewish people need to to be in Israel that they can come they can immigrate to Israel and concentrate and that the Jewish state must be strong and uh, prospering for the, for the sake of the all nations all around the world and I think that Christians and Israel and Jews in Israel and around the world share this kind of vision you know recently they launched in Jerusalem the Yuri Stern Road a street named after Yuri Stern, the foreign minister, Avidor Lirun was there, the mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat. Why do you think your father had such an impact, not just on the political makeup of the city, but also just, you know, with the day-to-day -day citizens in Israel? My father was a very dedicated uh, parliament member. He, he worked really hard every day only in helping people. People came to his office in their personal problems and he helped each and every one of them, no matter what he might get from there. He, he had a very large and open heart to everybody and people remember that. And every, every man that met him, had something was touched inside of him. It was very real and very rare in politicians. And I think uh, that every, everyone I meet remembers my father in a very warm perspective. Mark, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would like to invite the Christian community to help us at the Yuri Stern Foundation, help other people, people in need. I think that your help is really needed and we can together, the Jews and Christians together, can support much more people in Israel, people that need that help. Thank you, Mark, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, Shining Light from Israel.
I was in Minot, North Dakota, uh, partners in a used car and truck business. Money, girlfriends, cars, the whole uh, enchilada. When I got this uh, phone call from New York, I got a letter from a, a friend of mine at TWA, called this number and asked for Swifty. Just like that. So what the hell, I called the number. Livingston, where the hell are you? We've been waiting a week for you. I said, waiting for me? Huh? Yeah, we need you right away. I said I'd wear a flying jacket, so a leather jacket, so they would recognize me. And they said to bring a log book of proof that I was a pilot. They were meeting at a hotel on 57th Street in New York, the Henry Hudson Hotel. Served great martinis. A fellow who identified himself as Steve Schwartz, apprising me of the fact that Israel was going to declare itself a state, that they were going to be attacked by at least five Arab armies and they had no way to defend themselves, except that they had purchased some airplanes, but they had no one to fly them. And would I be in a position to help? The idea that Jews were going to fight, I found exciting. It's about time. It wasn't like a newspaper had joined the Haganah. It was illegal, of course. He said, look, I know there's going to be a war there, and I'm, I'm a fighter pilot, and I want to go there. And I had just made up my mind that nothing was going to stop me. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do this. The alternative is too hard for me to envision the possibility of what the Arabs could have done. And they talked about the fact that what Hitler did will be nothing compared to what we're going to do. You know, you're talking about 600,000 Jews and 50 million Arabs surrounding them. I didn't see how they could possibly survive. The Arab countries had established air forces. We had almost nothing. Four junk airplanes. Different propeller, different engines from uh, spare parts that the German Air Force left behind in Czechoslovakia. I remember sitting in the cockpit of my ME-109 wearing a German uniform, uh, a German helmet, a German parachute. What's a nice Jewish boy from St. Paul doing in a place like this? <laughs> the irony of it did not escape any of us. The Arabs had squadrons, they had planes, they had tanks, they had guns, they had everything, except that will to win that the Israelis had, that they had to win. He says, look, six miles from where we're standing now at the airbase is the whole Egyptian army of about 10,000 men, about 500 vehicles, tanks, trucks, and tankers, and we have nothing to stop them. I said, well, tomorrow I was gonna go. He says, if you don't go now, they'll be in Tel Aviv in the morning and there's no Israel. These airplanes had never been test flown. They were assembled in the hangar. And they just started up, taxed out, and attacked the Egyptian army coming up the coast. I looked back, and I saw the land of Israel. I looked there, I saw the enemy that came to destroy us. I just did a quick schmice royal, even though I'm not religious. Turn the airplane upside down, because the dive bomb, the steeper the dive, the more accurate is the hit. I told Lou, this is about the dumbest thing that I'd ever heard of, and I would never have done it, but they stopped the Egyptians cold. I felt more at home in Israel than I did 
in the United States. I felt this is my home. As a Jew, I now felt proud of being Jewish. I was born to be here on that moment of history to contribute to Israel's survival. I had done something good for once. We built an Air Force. We started an Air Force. If you wrote the history of the Jewish people a thousand years from now, there are two things that I can tell you will be in it. Um, one is the Holocaust, one is the birth of the State of Israel. The, the people who went to Israel and participated in this, in this effort were you know, really part of two of the most significant, incredible, devastating, tragic, uh, euphoric episodes in Jewish history, I, I think for all time. Shortly before I left, I happened to be in Tel Aviv when they were bringing in refugees from the death camps in Europe. I remember them getting down on their hands and knees and kissing the ground. I knew then and there, that was the reason that I came. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Welcome to this new episode of ICEJ report. I just want to share with you a few thoughts about exciting things what God is doing in our world today. I was intrigued over the last couple of weeks when I was looking about the incredible numbers of people getting saved and finding Jesus in the southern hemisphere of our planet. In the global south, in the southern region of our world, Christianity is growing at an unprecedented measure. If you just look to the continent of Africa, in 1917, there were some 140 million believers there, and four decades later, 2010, already this number grew to 490 million believers, half a billion Christians just in Africa. If this growth continues over the next decades, we will see soon more than 1 billion believers just in Africa. Very similar developments are taking place in Latin America and also in Southeast Asia. God is moving powerfully today. Major revivals are taking place in China, in India, and in many other places, in particular in the southern part of our world today. I know you might ask yourself, why don't I see this similar revival and the same spirit moving in the places where I am living, in particular if you come from Western countries. And I want to challenge you with the word of God, what Jesus told his disciples when he said in John chapter 4, verse 35, Do you not say there are still a four month and then comes the harvest? Behold, Jesus say, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And I want to challenge you today, if you look at Christianity, don't be depressed, but see that we are living indeed in a time of harvest. God is moving powerfully in the world and he wants you to be part of what he is doing. Just a few days ago, I was in the President's Palace for his annual reception for Christian leaders here in the Holy Land. President Shimon Peres said something very astonishing. He said, never before in the history of the Jewish people were Jewish Christian relations better than they are today. And this is an astonishing statement. Just look at the tragic history of Jewish Christian relations and the atrocities and the pogroms and even the Holocaust which took place just 70 years ago. And to say today, 70 years after Auschwitz, those relations are at a historic high, that is nothing short than a miracle. 
And indeed, if you look to the church today, to those centers of revivals, in particular in the south of our world, you will see that when people come to faith in Jesus, when they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, they all share a love and a passion for the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, the state of Israel today recognizes evangelical Christians all over the world as the key strategic partner for the future. And there are many projects which Christians are undertaking today where Israel sees that they are not alone. Just during the last Gaza war, it were Christians which were the first which were down in places like Sterot, which were under constant fire. We just built in Haifa a home for Holocaust survivors and the municipality of Haifa even decided to rename the street into the International Christian Embassy Street in Haifa. This is historic. It shows you that our relationship with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, they have reached a new level. And I want to invite you to become part of this exciting world. Our work reaches out to every segment of society because we want to change the relations between Christians and Jews in our days. I'm Jürgen Bühler, the Executive Director of the Christian Embassy, and I want to invite you to become part of the exciting things what God wants to do in this coming year. We see exciting developments taking place, and I want you to become part of them. I want to invite you to become a partner of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. Please contact us at our website www.icej.org or send us an email at info at icej.org. We would love to hear from you and partner with you together in this coming year to pray a major blessing to the nation of Israel. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Aaron Viner reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.